So this is the third and final video on blockchain um, technologies. And um, again, they're short, high level in nature, but if you're interested in finding out more, check out some of the links at the end of each video. This one is on the legal issues, looking at the general legal issues, and then some of the legal issues related to smart contracts in particular. So the key thing from a general perspective really is looking at whether we're talking about a public blockchain network or a private blockchain network, because they have differences in terms of the, the rights and obligations that could underpin the service being provided. For example, with a public blockchain network, you know, there's truly no central authority, no one operator in control of the network. It's open source based, it's free to use. You're really dependent and reliant on the community to, amongst other things, lend compute power to the network through the nodes to actually allow it to run. And so anyone that develops this, this software, the blockchain developer, is you know, will make that software available for free with very little warranties and representations and lots of disclaimers, often flowed through from the open source software they've used uh, and augmented in some respects. And so really the key sets of documents to look at are the governance framework underpinning the network. Um, and the challenge at the moment is a lot of these networks, the governance regime is quite disparate. It's not in one clean document, it's sort of housed in all sorts of places, ad hoc documents, NDAs, chat rooms, uh, repositories. I think where it gets more interesting is in the private blockchain network, especially for our clients. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, part of it's to do with control. Participants, um, you know, clients that want to set up a, block, a blockchain network, have control in terms of who actually joins the network. And that can be very useful in terms of satisfying, for example, AML or KYC checks. And also the blockchain developer has control as well, more control than in a sort of public um, uh, ecosystem. And so it can provide more commitments around the actual delivery of the network. In my mind, the key sets of agreements are obviously the software development agreement agreement between the blockchain developer and the, the client, which could be a number of clients or a JV company set up to um, receive the network and the services underpinning it. Um, and that's just a technology agreement, so the usual issues apply there. Um, the other agreements are the terms of use governing the actual use of the service when it's up and running. And there I look at analogies like the card scheme rules in the payment sector. And there's, you know, there's kind of two bilateral arrangements. There's the arrangement between the, 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 the user and the blockchain developer. And then there's the relationship between two users to a transaction that's been validated across the network. And what are the rights and obligations of the parties in each of those scenarios? People talk about this mantra about code is law. That's quite an interesting um, observation and point, point of view. I think the assumption that all the terms and conditions um, can be captured into computer code, at the moment at least, I think um, doesn't, doesn't work in my mind. I think it assumes contracts are simple bare transactions where you can easily capture the code, um, uh, the, well, the terms into the code, and fails to understand some of the complexities around terms and conditions and the subjective nature of them. For example, um, under that assumption, code is law, um, how do you deal with non-exhaustive lists of circumstances like force majeure events? How do you code that into, into the smart contract? You can't, don't have the flexibility of interpretation um, where you could rely on a judge to say, okay, well, this is what the party to the smart contract meant in this situation which wasn't foreseen by the drafts person or the, the, the computer um, coder, or you don't have the benefit of all the saving provisions developed over time by law, um, whether that's common law, case law, or statute to deal with issues like misrepresentation or mistake um, or fraud. Um, so in my, my opinion, I think the actual law, the terms and conditions governing the smart contract is a composite of the smart code, which has to be viewed by the parties and approved, and also like a natural language normal contract. So the composite of those two are the T's and C's uh, until we get to a situation where we've got lawyers actually uh, coding the smart contracts.